Yeah, we had some sushi, and it was great. It was wonderful. But Sean is a great guy, uh, clearly a man of God. He has a youth group out there um, in the Pittsburgh area, and he, it's very clear that God's doing some big things in his life. So I just want you guys to welcome Sean Gallo. Thank you, thank you. It's nice to be here. It's nice to be here at Renaissance, here at Elevate. Uh, right now, Renaissance is in the middle of a series entitled Winning. And so we're excited to, to be joining uh, with your parents upstairs and joining and starting this series. Uh, by a show of hands, how many of you in this room would say that you enjoy winning? You love to win. Anybody? For those of you that don't have your hands raised, I assume that you like to lose. Is that correct? I see one. You didn't raise your hand, do you? Okay, it's cool. It's cool. It's cool. Uh, but for those of you, maybe you've been at Elevate. I know some of you had just gotten back from, from summer camp a couple weeks ago. But we, at Renaissance, you've been in a series entitled Hashtag Winning. And when I think about winning, I think of several different things. But this is a study uh, that you see that comes out of the Beatitudes. And the Be Beatitudes start, it's a part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. And as you study the word Beatitude and you look at the origin and, and look at what the word Beatitude means, you, you see that it comes from the Latin Beatitudo, which means happiness. It means to be happy. It's this current state of happiness. So I think about what in the world makes us happy. In this short portion of Scripture in the Beatitudes, in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus is able to, to shift the way that we, as individuals, view success. The way that success is viewed in this world. Jesus, he comes and he just completely shatters this idea of what success, what hashtag winning really looks like. And so, the word beatitude, as I said, means blessedness. And, and this phrase that we see throughout the Beatitudes, blessed are, means a current state of happiness or well-being. And so, for most of us, winning equals happiness. We're most happy when we win. How many of you would agree with this statement? You're, you're most happy when you win something or you enjoy losing. I'm a hockey player. When I lose, I, I had a hockey game last Sunday night, and we were playing in 102 degree heat. And it's pretty miserable when you're outside playing these different things. And so for us, we actually lost the game 11 to 1. That is embarrassing. Like, it was embarrassing. And that phrase that you often hear, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose, it matters what? How you play the game. Well, I think whoever said that didn't lose too often because whenever you lose at 102 degree heat, it's not too fun. But when I think about winning... I think of several, several different things. How many of you want to win something right now because you enjoy winning? Anyone want to win something right now? What if I told you that underneath all of your seats, well, no. for those of you that are actually sitting in chairs, there is something under each of your chairs. So for those of you that are sitting in this immediate area, feel free. Everyone, look under your chair. But there's, someone sitting next, there's no one sitting next to you. Sorry, those of you back there, you don't have anything. But everyone should have something. Just hold on to that. You should have a piece of Hershey's chocolate straight from the great place of Pennsylvania, which we come from. You can't eat it yet. Just hold on to it. Don't, don't hold it too tightly because then it'll melt. It's not M&M's, so it will melt in your hands. What I want everyone to do is uh, just hold on to your piece of chocolate for just a minute. But for my wife, Carly, and I, uh, Carly's my wife. She's sitting right back there. The time that we feel most like we're winning is when we have an awesome meal. We are foodies. We would what you call foodies. Uh, we're the people that, that tweet pictures of food. I know you're probably like, oh, those people. Yes, we are those people. Uh, but we have developed this, this desire to eat some of the craziest things in the world. And so anytime we go anywhere, we try 
whatever is placed in front of us. Some of the things we've eaten in the past month, uh, fish eyeballs. Uh, has anyone here ever had a fish eyeball? Couple people? What did you think? Did you enjoy it? It's kind of creamy, um, but then there's like this marble inside. It's a little different, uh, but it, it's, it's a delicacy. In, in Japan, uh, if you order a fish head, which is common in Japan, you eat the, the, the guest of honor eats the fish eyeball. So we each had a fish eyeball. So we had quail eggs, raw quail eggs as well. Uh, recently we were in Canada, we went to Toronto, and, or Toronto as they say it in Canada. Uh, and we tried, in Canada, they eat some weird things, at least in Toronto. Sorry for those of you that are from Canada, I apologize. Uh, but we tried uh, bone marrow, has anyone tried bone marrow? Uh, they, they take, the, they take the, the, the bone of the cow, saw it in two, and then bake it. And you eat the inside, and you eat the bone marrow. Um, sorry if any of you were vegan. Um, this one, this next one's really going to bother you. Uh, also, while we were in Canada, we tried horse. Um, because horse is illegal in the United States, but in Canada, they eat it regularly. So, well, not everybody, but we tried, we tried horse. Um, and everyone asked me, what did it taste like? It was like a sweet, tender beef. And so, but we try different things. We love different foods. And so in Pittsburgh, there's tons of restaurants and we really started to just love going out to eat and trying different restaurants. And every year in Pittsburgh at Heinz Field where the Steelers play, they host the Pittsburgh Best Restaurants Party. And the top 60 restaurants, including Frenchuary, they come to these places and they, uh, each restaurant has samples that you can walk around and sample. And so, Every, we, we've been waiting over a year to attend this event, to go and just be able to sample the top 60 restaurants in Pittsburgh. But a few days before we had gotten to, the, to Heinz Field where the Steelers play, one of our favorite restaurants in Pittsburgh called Salt of the Earth had been tweeting this one photo, and I believe we have the photo. This, they, they tweeted this nonstop for a week, and it said this, it had AU, which is the periodic symbol for gold, and then it had these numbers, 10, 7, 6, 3. And for me, I love thinking through things. I don't know about you, but my favorite TV show ever was Lost. And so, like, for me... <laughs> sorry. Sorry. I didn't mean to get on with a heart attack. Uh, but for me, like, that show was so involved and so intricate that you had to weave in and out of different things to figure out what was going on. And so for me, my, for a week straight, I'm like, okay, 10, 7, 6, 3. Now, the party was on June 3rd, so I was able to figure out, okay, so 6-3, that's June 3rd, but what in the world does the rest mean? Obviously, 79 is the place where gold is on the periodic table, but what does the rest mean? So we're just thinking through this, and we couldn't figure out, so we're like, okay, first thing, we get to the best restaurants party, we are running straight to their table to see what's going on. So we get to the best restaurants table, and we get to the table, and next slide, please. We get to the table and there's all these white boxes. We're like, what in the world is going on? This is the best restaurant in Pittsburgh. It's been rated the best restaurant in Pittsburgh two years in a row. And in these boxes was just a piece of bread and butter. Like, seriously, I just paid this much money for bread and butter. You've got to be kidding me. So we're like, okay, what in the world is going on? And then two minutes later, this waitress comes out. And she's holding a sign. And above it, it says, stay gold, hashtag 412. We're like, okay. So we just started taking these random bread boxes, and we're like, we open it up, and it's bread, and we're like, we throw it away. And then Carly, my wife, got a box, and it was a golden ticket. It was like Willy, how many people love Willy Wonka? Anybody? We got golden tickets. My wife had received one of these waivers that said, you must sign your life away, essentially. We are taking you away from Heinz Field, and you have to eat whatever we give you. Like, okay. But I didn't get one right away, so I started going through all this bread and butter, and then I just throw it away. I was like, I have to go. I can't leave my wife go by herself. I, I need to go eat this food as well. And so, <laughs> so we just kept throwing these, this bread and butter away until we finally both had a pass. So we signed these waivers, and next thing we know, we were leaving Heinz Field where the Steelers play. And next slide. We were led by a, a marching band. There was a full marching band that met us at the door. <laughs> this marching band, comprised of 30 people, led us to this white unmarked van. Very unsafe. I never encourage you to get in an unmarked white van. But we did it anyways because we knew how good the food was going to be. So from that point on, they, you know what they told us next? You have to put blinds, oh hold on, go back one slide please. You have to put blindfolds on. 
So we're blindfolded in this unmarked white van thinking, what in the world is happening to us right now? But it was one of those times where you're so excited about what's about to happen that like you could care less. You're willing to do whatever it takes to be able to go because we knew how good this restaurant was. So we get in this unmarked white van, and of course the seat we were sitting in in the van wasn't secure, so the driver hits the gas pedal, we go flying, and our back seat shaking, and finally we stop about 10 minutes later, and we're at the Andy Warhol Museum, and Andy Warhol's one of the most famous artists of the last century, and he, he's from Pittsburgh, so there's museums in Pittsburgh, and they had set up, in this museum, this restaurant had set up a table for 10 people. So go back to that, that first slide, please. There was that symbol on the door, the AU, um, but if you could go back to the AU symbol in slide two. So I finally figured out there were 10 people chosen out of 2,500 to go for this one dinner. Now realize that restaurants would spend up to $5,000 on this meal to serve these people, but instead of serving $2,500 or 2,500 people a $5,000 uh, amount of food, they served a $5,000 amount of food to 10 people, and we were two of the 10. So it was epic. So, <laughs> a couple slides, if you could go back to that one slide. So we got to this hallway, and just like Willy Wonka, if you've seen the movie, we're stuck in this hallway, and they're just blasting music, and we're like, oh, sensory overload. Like, we couldn't process everything that was going on. And so we walk into this table that is just decorated by one of the finest florists in all of Pittsburgh, and there's 10 of us, and each of us have an assigned seat. Our names were already on the table. And we're like freaking out, like these people are creeping on us, like how do they know our name? But they had some way of knowing. And so we get to our seats and we sit down. And over the course of the next two hours, we were served by butlers the most amazing meal I have ever had in my life. To just show you a few things that we had, uh, next slide. We had uh, caviar on chicken skin. I know it sounds really gross, but it was unbelievable. Caviar on chicken skin. And then we had this egg yolk with meringue dish. It was kind of awkward because the egg yolk was raw, but we ate it anyways because it's a $5,000 meal, so you're going to eat it. So next slide. We had langoustines, which is this weird crustacean, somewhere between a shrimp and a lobster. Uh, we enjoyed those, I guess. I'm not a big crustacean fan. Um, and then our next dish was flaw with coconut and coffee. Now here's, here's the trivia question. Can anyone tell me what flaw is? Anybody? It looks like spam. It looks like spam. Doesn't taste like spam. It tastes like butter, actually. Anybody? Anybody want to take a guess? Let's take a stab. Yes, it is. It's a. It's an overfattened goose liver. That is what flaw is. Is overfat. I'm telling you, we eat weird things. But I promise, we're not that weird. We just like to eat weird things. So after that, we had squab breast. Uh, I don't have a picture of that. Can anyone tell me what squab is? It is a bird. Anyone want to know what kind? No. Want to take a guess? Think of the one bird you would never want to eat. A vulture. Uh, I wouldn't want to eat a penguin either. It's a dirty bird. Not like dirty. Pigeon. It's a pigeon. It is. It is a pigeon. So we ate, we ate the squab breast. And then the next, the next two dishes blew me out of the water. I was like ready to never eat again after this dish. We had this steak. It was a Wagyu beef steak, which is essentially, it was a thousand dollar piece of meat, this big, that they cut up and served between 10 of us. And then we had this, this one dish. Everyone would love this one, I promise, it was normal. It was strawberry sorbet, it was kind of like ice cream. Then there was like this little cream log underneath. Oh, it was unbelievable. But that night, Carly and I left knowing that we were a part of something very, very special. Uh, uh, at Heinz Field that night. We knew that, that we had just been a part of something very, very special. That a restaurant had just taken $5,000 and turned it into an evening to remember for 10 people. But you know what the worst part of all of that was? Is that four hours after I ate this $5,000 meal, I was hungry again. <laughs> Honestly, I just, I desired all this food and I just wanted more, I expected more. Whenever they came out, we got the menu after we had eaten everything. So we didn't know what we were eating while we ate it. But we got this menu and we're like, that's it? After seven courses of, of drinks and, and food, we're like, that's it? We, we wanted more. How come this thing wasn't 10 courses? But I think this is how a lot of us view our own lives. You see, we start to hunger for things that don't satisfy us. And we start looking for more and more and we start expecting more. 
Now some of you, if you hold up your chocolate pieces, how many of you got chocolate? There should be three gold pieces amongst those three pieces of chocolate. Did anyone get a gold piece? Calvin, you gotta, if you come up here, that would be great. Anyone else? Anyone else have a gold piece? You already ate it? Was it gold? Okay, if it's not gold, it's okay. All right, you got a gold piece. Anyone else? There should be one more gold piece. There's a golden ticket somewhere. Don't you want to win the chocolate factory? <laughs> Keep, if, it's, if you don't have it, look under the chair that someone it wasn't sitting under. Because there's three pieces. Silver, sorry. There should be a piece under each chair. Check that seat. You picked a gold? You ate it already? No. No. Where'd you put it? We just put it back. We, I think it's back there. Uh, anyone else want to win a gold piece? <laughs> Alright, because you like Lost. It's perfect. <laughs> I do. Alright, so we have our three gold ticket winners. Congratulate them. So we have Calvin, correct? Calvin, Carly, if you could come help me get the bags. Calvin, and then. Cameron. Cameron. It's okay. Cameron, it's okay. Yeah. It's very emotional. And Sam. Calvin, Cameron, and Sam. They are our three golden ticket winners. So they have the chance to win the chocolate factory. Actually, they don't. Um, I wish I owned a chocolate factory, but I don't. But I do have these wonderful bags. And so, Calvin, I have to ask you. Oh, God. <laughs> This is gross. Did you sit on it for an hour? Oh, should I get the gold piece? Where is it? Oh, that's gross. We have that. But here's my question. Would you rather have that gold piece or trade it for what's in bag number one? Keep the gold piece. You want bag number one. Okay. Feel free. Pull out what's in bag number one and show the rest of us. That would be great. Look at that. It's another chocolate. Thanks, Calvin. I would not eat that piece of chocolate though. It's pretty gross looking. All right, you can sit down. Thanks, Calvin. Cameron, you're next. Would you rather? Do you have your piece or no? Oh, thank you for not having a melted, disgusting piece of chocolate. I really appreciate that. Would you rather have this piece of chocolate or what's in bag number two? It's a bag. <laughs> what? I'm kind of like. Like, <laughs> Cameron, you're killing it. I don't know. Oh, no. I'll keep this. I just want to see. Oh, okay. <laughs> you're really putting me in a tough situation. <laughs> All right, go for it. Yeah, that would be perfect. <laughs> Pull it out. See what's in there. Oh, never mind. Yeah, see? Oh, my God. It's even bigger. It's not going to be the same thing. It's humongous. It's not going to be the same thing. That's very nice okay. of you. <laughs> Your name again was? Sam. Sam, and you like Lost. I really like Lost. That's awesome. Who's your favorite character? Charlie. Charlie. Oh. Sorry. I'm a Desmond guy. I love Desmond. <laughs> We're back. Do you have your chocolate? I think you win, actually. I, the, we yeah. fake one. It's okay. Fake, yeah. All right. Well, would you rather have your piece of chocolate that didn't even win? Or what's in bag number three? <laughs> you have nothing to lose now because you I didn't even win. I got nothing to lose, so bag three. All right. Good choice. I'm so afraid. <laughs> Why are you afraid? What do you think? Is it like a dead animal? I know we eat weird food, but we're not that weird. Just, just for your chance. Congrats. There's nothing! Oh! It, it's an onion! Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> You can tell me you're going to eat that. He will. Oh, he will. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Thank no, don't eat it right now, because no one will want to talk to you afterwards. Here's the thing. Is that oftentimes we turn to things. When we hunger for things, we're oftentimes looking for more and more and more. Sometimes we pursue different things. We pursue image. We pursue relationships. And they leave us searching for more, looking for more in this life. And oftentimes when we continue to search for more and more, we oftentimes end up empty-handed. We end up surprised by what happens at the end. We end up disappointed 
by what happens in the end. In Jesus' sermon in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, in this, this portion of Scripture called the Beatitudes, in verse 6, Jesus issues this statement, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Now, for many of us, especially as Christians, as people who've placed their faith in Christ, I think this idea of righteousness is something that we can throw around. It's a word that oftentimes you hear in a church setting, but a lot of people that call themselves Christians don't know how to define. So what does it mean to be righteous? Let's take a look. To be righteous means to be good, to be trustworthy, to be noble, to be innocent, to be moral, to be worthy, to be honest and just, law-abiding, fair, creditable. If you take a look and, and you're familiar with Scripture, you start to notice that there's, there's a couple trends that take place as you try to define what righteousness is. You'll see not only that a lot of these correspond with the fruit of the Spirit, but they're also oftentimes attributed to the character of Jesus Christ. They're, these characteristics are, are what makes Jesus, who he is. Jesus is good. Jesus is honest. Jesus is noble. Jesus is innocent. He's moral. He's worthy. He's just. He's, he's fair. He's creditable. So what, when we take a look at this verse in Matthew chapter 5, verse 6, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. I want you to view that in two ways. To remember the context of this verse, but also think of it this way. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for for Christ's likeness, for they will be filled. So often we find ourselves chasing things that don't sustain us. We chase meals that, that only fill us for so long and oftentimes leave us hungry and searching for more. They give us the appearance of fulfillment, but oftentimes leave us disappointed. For many of us, we chase after image. We hunger for relationships. We thirst for attention. Even as Christians, sometimes I'm afraid that We've, we've started to chase a certain, a certain set of rules of do's or don'ts, and we've made Christianity about the things that you do or you don't do. But Christianity and, and faith in Christ is so much more. It's so much deeper than that. So what do we do when we're hungering and thirsting for the wrong things? What do we do when we realize that we have an appetite for something that's not going to bring us true satisfaction, true fulfillment in life? We change our appetites. That's what we do. I know a lot of you probably grew up and you, you liked certain foods and there were certain foods that you ate all the time and then there were certain foods that you wouldn't even, you wouldn't even come close to. I want you to think for a second, what's that one food that just grossed you out beyond anything? Like what's that one food that really grossed you out? I have a, like a top five list of things that really grossed me out. Uh, number one was always mustard. I just couldn't get over mustard. It was just so gross to me. I love it now, but we'll get to that in a second. Relish. Oh, relish. Oh. Just sweet pickles in general. I just could never do sweet pickles. Could never do relish. It was so gross to me. Bologna. I don't even want to start on bologna. Like, what is it? Nobody knows. It's kind of along the same lines as, like, I, I enjoy hot dogs if they're grilled. But boiled hot dogs? How many of you have ever had a boiled hot dog? I apologize if you have ever had to eat a boiled hot dog. And then another thing that I've always despised, mostly because it smells like feet, is salt and vinegar potato chips. Now listen, listen. The worst is whenever someone on a, a student ministry trip will open a bag or a can of Pringles salt and vinegar flavored in a van. It is the worst thing in the entire world. Like it smells like someone has not washed their feet for like three years. Like, and they've all come together. It's like a van full of smelly feet people. And so, anyways, I told you about this hockey game I had uh, last week and we played in like 100 to 102 degree heat. I got back and I'm just like dying, like chugging Gatorade and then a bottle of water and then more Gatorade. I'm like, Lord, please help me, because I can't breathe. Like, I don't feel healthy right now. And then all of a sudden, I got this strange craving. I'm like, Carly, I want salt and vinegar potato chips. She's like, who are you? I'm like, I have no idea. But they say taste buds change every seven years or so. But did you know that you can also train your appetite to desire certain things? They say that you can train your appetite in several different ways. 
not only by just thinking positive things while you're eating different foods, but also it's a matter of who you surround yourself with. If you're in good company when you eat, I could have been with um, some very, very strange people at that dinner that I was a part of and been fed very strange food. And I would be like, okay, well, this is all just very strange. But because the company was great, I was able to enjoy the food even more. We're able to train our appetites. Recently, I started biking a good bit. And as I did that, I was like, okay, well, if I'm going to bike, I might as well at least try and track what I'm eating and what I'm putting into my body. And as I did that, I started to realize that I didn't desire some of the same things that I desired before because I realized what I was putting into my body. I realized I was eating way too much junk food, and so I had to filter some of those things out. And as I did that, as I continued to ride my bike, I was like, wait, I don't desire these things anymore. Like, I don't want a cheeseburger. I'd rather eat like a salad with like a piece of fish on it or something. I know that doesn't sound like normal people. Well, it may, but I just had this, my desires and my appetite had changed. But you see, we can do the same thing with our spiritual lives. We can start to change our appetites and the, the things that we desire spiritually. Sure, it applies to what we taste in real life, but it can be true of our spiritual lives as well. Here's the thing, is that if you start to pursue Christ and start seeking Christ, suddenly you're going to start to see the benefits that exist in that. As you start committing to growing in your faith, your appetite will change. And you'll start to pursue those things more. The things that which distracted you or didn't satisfy you or weren't good for you, they won't be as appealing. They won't be as craving. They won't be cravings to you because now you're developing appetite for something more beneficial. It's not going to be easy, but it'll be rewarding. For a lot of us, we've made Christianity a matter of convenience. We can do it when we have time. When I have time, then maybe I'll work on this relationship with Christ a little bit more, and if not, then I'll be okay. Oftentimes, in most circumstances, I've seen that students won't, that people, we as humans won't, because we get caught up in ourselves. You'll turn to everything else to fill these areas, these voids in your own life, to try and fulfill you, to bring uh, some, to sustain you, to bring happiness to your life. And oftentimes, they'll leave you flat on your face looking for something more, hungering and thirsting for more. I want to encourage you today to focus on one truth and just one thing alone, is to focus on being Christ-centered, to be Christ-centered. Why? Because Jesus Christ is our only way, our only route to fulfillment, to satisfaction, to contentment, to true happiness. Now we have to realize that we won't experience these things until the day that we meet Christ face to face. But in the meantime, it's something that we have to strive and something that we have to work towards in to becoming like Christ. That's our goal, to be Christ-centered, to, to have Christ at the center of everything that we do and everything that we are. Scripture doesn't say, blessed are those in Christ when it's convenient for them, but blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, or blessed are those who hunger and thirst for Christ-likeness. In Psalms chapter 3, or chapter 63, verse 1, David explained it like this. He said, You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you, I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. David, in his language, he doesn't just say, Hey, I want you when it's convenient for me. But God, I believe in you now, in every moment of every day, every bit of me longs for you. It's this Christ-centeredness. In John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever comes to me will never go thirsty. So whoever comes to Christ will never hunger again. Whoever comes to Christ will never be thirsty. A hunger or, or thirst for Christ, a pursuit of Christ-likeness, is our only way to true fulfillment. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, it says, It is because of Him, Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God that is our righteousness. Jesus Christ has become our righteousness. We look to Him for everything that we are supposed to be. We center our lives around Him. Why? Because it says, In Him we have our righteousness. 
And as I said, as we pursue Christ, we realize that it, it won't be truly satisfied on this side of death. But we must pursue Christ's likeness in the meantime. When we center our lives on Christ, it becomes a whole lot easier to look like Christ than it does to model our righteousness, our goodness, our Christ likeness off of no one else but Jesus. As Christians, it's become really easy to look at a youth leader, to look at a youth pastor, to look at a parent. For how am I supposed to look like Christ when our one true guide is Christ himself? Because people will always disappoint us. People will always fail. But Christ never does. Christ is our only route, our only way to true fulfillment. He is our righteousness. So what does this look like in your daily lives as we close? What does, this, what does this look like this next week for you? This week when no one else is around, I want to encourage you to strive for nobility. Be noble. When you stub your toe and you're trying to search for words to say, and you want to say the right thing, strive for the right words. When your parents ask you to do something, Strive for goodness. Obey them. Do what they ask. When a friend tells you something and they don't want you to tell anyone else, and you're just dying, you're just like itching and you're like freaking out because you want to go tell someone else, strive for trustworthiness. Whatever your situation is this week, when you encounter a situation, I want you to ask your, yourself this question. Is my response in this situation going to make me more or less like Christ? Our goal is to be Christ-centered, to become more like Christ in what we do. So this week, when you're encountered with a situation, ask yourself, is my response in this situation right here, right now, going to make me more or less like Christ? Do you guys want to bow your heads? Lord, I thank you for each of the students that are in this room. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that you've brought me here today. Lord, I pray for each of these students in this room. Lord, as each and every one of us deals with insecurities, Lord, as we, we chase and pursue after things, Lord, that oftentimes leave us hungry and thirsty for more. Lord, I pray that you would help us to see, Lord, that you are the giver of life. Lord, that you are the bread of life. And whoever comes to you will never hunger and will never thirst again. Lord, I pray for each student in this room that, Lord, they would see you as our guide. Lord, that you are the only way. And, Lord, that you would help us to live in light of that. Lord, that each decision and each opportunity we have, Lord, that you would allow us, Lord, to, to look more like you in each and everything that we do. Lord, we thank you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks, son. Can you clap it up? Anyone else? else? Big salt vinegar chips fans? Like, love them? Uh, yeah, I love them. Um, so Sean and Carly are going to hang out for a little while if you guys want to hang out and ask some questions or just give them a high five or meet them or whatever. So we'll be hanging out back here. Um, but if not, we're dismissed. And thanks so much. We'll see you guys next week.